Hello, everybody. Um, uh, this is uh, my attempt here to uh, uh, deliver a video presentation here of our first uh, lecture. And um, I just tried earlier and it did not work, so let me try one more time. Um, all right, so. Um, Um, I'm going to present just briefly on uh, the details about this course, and um, uh, we'll be discussing uh, uh, scientific notation in the, the units uh, that we'll be using here, and um, I'll, I'll, we'll also be working a few problems, and so um, let's go ahead and jump in. So the course syllabus um, is on Blackboard. Please uh, read that carefully. And um, I will be clarifying any uh, uh, issues about the when the deadlines are and so on. Um, but you'll see that there's uh, several dates that will be fairly regular and others that will be, um, uh, uh, will, will be announced on, on Blackboard. And so you're responsible for the due dates. Uh, unfortunately, um, Blackboard will not accept uh, late submissions, and so uh, you are responsible for making sure that you meet uh, the deadlines for uh, the various assignments in the class. Uh, the course textbook um, is uh, Musicians Acoustics um, by Scott Parker, and I'm going to try to uh, bring up a, uh, my camera here, and uh, you can see I've got my... Okay, I'm going to just show this book here. So this is our course textbook here. It's uh, Musicians Acoustics um, by Scott Parker. I'm trying to get the glare out of the way here so you can see that. And um, you'll find actually that it's a uh, pretty cool book. There are a few equations in there, but there's not a lot. And uh, you'll find that it's actually um, a pretty easy uh, book to read. Um, it has uh, a lot of cool information. I'll usually try to point out which part in the chapter we're, we're covering so that you know what, uh, what to look for what to be paying attention to um, as you're working problems, as you're trying to figure out how these things are actually working. So um, so this is the textbook. Please purchase a copy of it. We'll follow this um, very carefully in, uh, in our lectures and also in our activities. And, uh, and so in a lot of our um, uh, problems, uh, both in class and also in the, in the, um, on the exams, will be coming directly from this text. Um, so this is a hybrid course, and um, uh, this was in order to accommodate the number of students for this course. And um, and the uh, uh, the plan is is that um, I uh, am at the time of recording. I'll, I'm planning to uh, uh, send a list onto Blackboard uh, of two different groups. One will be a Monday group. The other one will be a Wednesday group. And if you're in the Monday group, um, then you just come on Mondays. And if you're on the Wednesday group, you just come on Wednesdays. When you come in, um, you will be doing a workshop or the activity. And you can see which one that you'll be doing, um, both on Blackboard and also uh, you can follow along in our syllabus. And um, the other period is going to be your lecture time. And this is going to be done online. Uh, I'll be posting videos up. And uh, please allot yourself uh, the full uh, amount of class time to watch and interact with a video lecture. Well, what does it mean to interact if you're just watching a video? Well, you're going to be actually uh, asked to pause at certain points and to stop and consider and think about what's going on. Um, and one way that I'd really encourage you to um, take an active stance towards your learning in this is that I realize that it can be a bit of a passive thing. We watch videos online and YouTube videos and so on. and. Um, and sometimes we just kind of sit and veg and watch the videos. And I, I want to encourage you to not do this um, for these videos. Um, they should be interactive in the sense that you're watching them, you're pausing, you're thinking about things, you're looking back in the text, you're, think, you're, you're saying, wait, I don't know if I understand that. Maybe you're writing down some questions to follow up when, you, when, you, um, when we have our uh, in-class time or during our workshops. Those would be also during office hours. It would be good times to ask questions to try and get clarifications on what's really going on. Um, so uh, there's exercises, there's things that I expect you to be able to practice uh, working through. Um, if we were doing this in an actual classroom environment, um, I would 
uh, pause the class and I'd go walk around and I would ask people um, what they thought and uh, I would have people working together in groups. So one way that you could do this is to find a buddy in the class, uh, maybe two, and you could plan to get together at a regular time each week and sit down and watch the um, video lecture, pause it, have some discussion. That would be a great way to take an active stance towards your learning. Um, so we have an online homework assignment. It'll be due every Thursday evening. And uh, we'll also have uh, uh, conceptual questions will be asked in class. Uh, there will also be some tutorials to do. And um, I'll also discuss ABCD cards um, in class. Uh, it's a way of sort of voting and a way to sort of uh, see if the class as a whole is really getting a concept. So let's go ahead and jump into some scientific content here. Um, we're going to be using uh, what's called SI units, which is um, this is a French uh, uh, expression here, the système international, and um, this is uh, the w system that actually the entire world uses except for the United States. So if you grew up in the United States, um, you probably are familiar more with pounds and inches and miles uh, as units. And so, for example, you, know, you go to the grocery store, um, then uh, you ask, well, how much is it for a pound of apples, right? But if you're in Europe, you would ask how much is it for a kilogram or for 100 grams and so on. Um, and uh, this is true in most places in the world that things are weighed out in this way. Um, the other thing that often comes up uh, is that when someone is traveling, they might go to Europe, for example, and they, they might hear a European person say, uh, uh, today was 39 degrees, and you might, well, if you grew up in the U.S., you might think, oh, it's pretty cold, actually. It's almost freezing, right? Uh, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but um, they're thinking in Celsius, and so that's actually very warm. That's over 100 degrees. So um, so that's, uh, or it's close to 100 degrees, I suppose. And um, so we'll, uh, we'll discuss later how do you convert between those different things, and how do you... Um, make a personal relationship with some of these units so they don't just feel like some weird abstract uh, thing. So, okay, so that's the uh, SI units. So our first question here is, the SI unit system uses which units for length, mass, and time? Well, in order to answer this question, I want to refer you to a resource. And uh, there's two resources um, that uh, are provided on, online um, under handouts. Uh, one of them here is our units and scientific notation for our course. And uh, so if you read through that, you're actually going to see an answer in the first page. So I'd like you to pause and take a moment to uh, uh, read this little first part here, and I bet you'll be able to even answer that question. The other um, uh, handout is a math review sheet. We'll be uh, taking a look at that. If you haven't taken a math class for a few years, um, this is this is made for you. And uh, even if you have, it might be a good idea to take a look through some of the things that are uh, available here and uh, and see if it makes sense to you. See if you're see if you're on uh, um, on the same page and it's and that you feel comfortable with this because the more comfortable that you feel with this, um, the more successful you're going to feel in this class. Okay, good. So um, uh, we look at uh, the SI uh, unit system and we wonder, okay, which are units for length? Well, if we read the, uh, the units in scientific notation, uh, we might see that uh, it is in meters. Uh, we might be tempted to think that maybe then, but why isn't it grams then for, uh, for mass? Well, because uh, we're trying to think about um, sort of human-sized units, in other words, uh, units that are kind of relatable uh, for a person. So in other words, a person is a couple meters tall, uh, typically. Uh, a, a kilogram is about the uh, how much a, um, if you were to pick up a ball or something like this, or a rock, um, it would maybe have a mass of about one kilogram. and. Uh, and a second is something that uh, you hear the click of on your watch. So it's, it's really things that we're familiar with. We're trying to relate to things that we have experiences with. So that's why our SI units are actually meters, kilograms, and seconds, and um, not centimeters, grams, uh, and certainly inches and pounds are something that's more familiar in the U.S., um, but this is not part of what is called SI unit. So we won't be using a lot of inches and pounds. Well, I'll refer to it sometimes because I think that many of you are um, familiar with this. 
Um, but also many of you were not born in the U.S. and uh, you were probably very well familiar with the SI system and so it might be a little bit silly that we're introducing uh, uh, this system, if, especially if you grew up with it. So, um, but please uh, bear with me as I, you know, kind of uh, uh, remind uh, us all about how the system is working. Okay, so we're going to jump into our first problem here. By the way, um, both of the next two problems are available in our um, units uh, um, handout. And so the handout here, if you notice going on to the next page, you're actually going to see solving word problems using units. And if you look at example one, you're actually going to see that it's really the same question um, as is in, this, in the slides here. But nonetheless, I'd like just to take a look at it and see if we can make some sense of what's going on. So um, the question says, oops, the question says, Suppose your average speed is uh, 80 kilometers per hour. Well, you might at this point think, well, gosh, I don't really know what uh, kilometer per hour really is. Is that, is that fast? Is it not fast? Um, let's not worry about that right now. Let's just see if we can solve this problem. How many hours does it take to, for you to drive the 1,600 kilometers or 1,600 kilometers from Denver to Chicago? Hmm. Well, okay, so it's like a word problem. Hmm. And uh, uh, I'm supposed to maybe like start drawing a picture or something. I don't know exactly how to solve this kind of problem, right? So I might think, what do I do? How do I start? What do I, what do I, how do I think of this problem in order to solve it? Well, I'm trying to help give you some tools to, uh, to be successful at solving any of these kinds of problems. And so um, I'm going to pause for a moment here. Um, take a moment and see if you can write down what you know and just give a try at it and see if you get the right answer. I'll pause. Okay, welcome back. And um, eh, I'm going to bring up our um, dot cam here. And uh, I'm going to drag this down a little bit if it wants to. It doesn't want to. It doesn't want to. <laughs> okay, it has a mind of its own. I was hoping to drag it down so that I could, we could sort of see. There we go. Okay, good. Um, and um, I'm going to write down some things that I know. One of them is I know the speed. Well, we write speed as a velocity. We're going to write it as V. It might seem a little strange to you. 80 kilometers per hour is our speed. And the distance is going to be 1,600 kilometers. Now, the cool thing here is that if I think about this here, like, so I may, I don't know, draw myself some big map of the U.S., something like this. Okay, there's my map. There's California. I know that's a really crappy drawing. But... Here's somewhere where Denver is. Here's somewhere where Chicago is. We gotta, we gotta travel that, right? We gotta go from there to there. And we're saying that that's 1,600 uh, kilometers, right? So I guess this is a pretty far distance. Um, just sort of like, you know, off the cuff, I'm probably guessing that this is like more than an hour and less than like, I don't know, less than a, a hundred hours. I don't know. Just, just guessing, right? Because like. Maybe you've taken a road trip across the country. You can always relate things to your experience, and you'll actually find that it's a really helpful tool is to think, well, oh, well, you know, actually, I drove to Denver one time. And driving to Denver is about the same distance, maybe-ish, as driving to Chicago, maybe. And, uh, and then you have a sense already, and you're like, oh, well, it took me two days of driving. So it took, like, I don't know, 15 hours, or it took, like, 17 hours, something like that. And you think, okay, well, that's roughly what I'm expecting. So the, that kind of thing is is a good thing to do, and I really encourage you to sort of try to do some sense making. Well, I'm going to show you a, a, a way of approaching this without really knowing what these units maybe make, uh, uh, what these units actually mean. Um, we can just simply look at the units here. If we have kilometers per hour and we have kilometers, right? If I take this distance and I divide by the velocity, the speed, um, you might find that actually I can do, let's see, distance divided by velocity. That's going to be 1,600 kilometers divided by 80 kilometers per hour. Now, the interesting thing here is that the kilometers actually cancel out with each other. And I'm left with 1 over 1 over hours. And it turns out that 1 over 1 over anything, like let's say the number 3, is going to just be the same as flipping that fraction. So in other words, 1 over 1 over hours, this whole thing over here is just going to be hours. So we'll have 1,600 divided by 80, and then we'll have 1 over 
1 over hours. In other words, this is just hours, is what I'm trying to say. Then we have the, the numbers over here. Well, we can just use a calculator if you'd like, but I want to encourage you to see if you can solve some of these things without a calculator. So for example, you might say, well, I can tack off the zeros here. You refer to the um, math review sheet if you're not sure what I'm meaning by uh, tacking off the zeros. And you'll have 160 divided by 8. We might know, okay, well, 16 divided by 8 is 2. So that means that 8 times 2 is 16. So 8 times 20 must be 160. So our answer is 20. So we're going to say that it's 20 hours that it takes to drive from uh, Denver uh, to Chicago. And we can see if we're right. Um, maybe it's uh, maybe we're maybe we're off, but let's let's give it a try. So uh, I'm going to go back over here and we'll, let's take a look at our answer. And indeed, the answer is 20 hours. So we were able to solve that problem just by looking at the units. Okay, we're going to move on to the second problem here. And uh, by the way, if you want some more um, uh, assistance with this thinking through these things, it's worked out very carefully in our units and scientific notation for musical acoustics handout. Um, so our second part here um, is another perhaps unfamiliar problem. You're being given a problem about units that maybe you don't really know about. And that's actually the point right now, is that we're trying to learn how to use units to solve problems. So I'm going to refrain from drawing a picture on this one, just to show you that, salt, that using uh, units and just thinking about the units is actually going to help us to figure, figure out how to solve this kind of problem. So I'm going to go ahead and again bring up um, my uh, presenter here so you can see a little bit of the uh, presentation at the same time as that we can see most of the text of this question. I'm going to go ahead and pause here, give you a chance to actually attempt solving this problem on your own. Go ahead and pause. All right, welcome back. Um, so did you figure it out? Were you able to, uh, to come up with a strategy to figure out uh, how much uh, force was exerted on the speaker dome? Well, let's take a look at a way to solve this. We know that the, um, uh, it, we're given that pressure is basically a force per area, or I could say a force per area, I could just write F per A if I'm feeling a little bit lazy here. As long as I know what I'm talking about, then this is okay. Um, I have, as long as you know what I'm talking about, so right, that's, that's part of our goal here is communicating these letters and what do these letters really mean and trying to uh, get at that. So we're trying to find a balance between convenience and clear communication. And um, okay, so P is F per A. Well, another way to look at this here is that P is in pascals, and that unit is newtons per square meter. So in other words, you can see here that newtons is a unit of force. Sometimes I write little brackets to remind ourselves that that's a unit. Meter squared is a unit of area, and pascals is a unit of pressure. And that's, that was all kind of given. Uh, even if you don't know what those things are right now, you can just say, okay, that's, that's what it is. And we're needing to solve for the force part, or the newtons part. So one thing you can do here is that if I have pressure is equal to F per A, I can solve for the F by simply multiplying both sides by A. So I'm going to multiply A, and they cancel out. Excuse me, they cancel out over here. And I'm left with that the force is going to be A times P, or P times A, whatever you'd like. So in other words, I can multiply the area, which I was given as 0.1 square meters, so maybe I can write my givens over here, is that the area is 0.1 square meters, and the pressure is equal to 1,000 pascals. Whether that's a lot or not remains to be known. We don't know. Um, we just know that these are what well, these are the things that are given. So I'm going to plug in for my P here, uh, 1,000 pascals. Good. So, okay, so pretty much now we just have to do 0.1 multiplied by 1,000, and I'm going to slide the units all over into the other side, which is going to be meters squared times pascal. And um, if we look at this here, I can maybe also show you here. If I multiply by a meter squared, multiply by a meter squared, you can actually see these cancel out, and newtons is actually equal to meter squared times pascal, or pascal times uh, meter squared, doesn't matter. Those are the same thing. So these are all units here. And um, so you can see that this is newtons. This one, 
Well, we could plug it into a calculator, but you know what? I think we can learn how to do these kinds of things just by, um, by thinking about it because uh, point 0.1, well, you've probably seen this before because 10 cents, one dime, is one-tenth of a dollar, right? So that is one-tenth. So in other words, you could write that 0 0.1 is the same thing as one-tenth, right? That's that they're equal to each other. So in other words, one-tenth of a thousand, you can think of it there being like an implied decimal place to the right of this thing. And that when you, um, uh, when you multiply by one-tenth, you're actually sliding that decimal over to the left. Please refer to the math review sheet if, you are un if you're not comfortable with this. And uh, here's 100. And so finally, our result is 100 newtons. Again, this uh, exact question is worked out um, in the units in scientific notation for uh, musical acoustics. And we'll find that our answer is 100 newtons. Very good. So did you get it? Um, if you're unfamiliar with this, um, I, I can refer you to some more uh, practice problems, but I, I urge you to spend some time seeing if you can make some sense of that and, and uh, practice that, and maybe even try some different numbers. Um, you could, uh, for example, um, give each other a problem where maybe, let's say, only the, the um, uh, force was given and the square meters, but you weren't given the pressure. And so how could you figure that out? So those are the kind of things we need to develop as skills. Okay, so we're going to move on to our, our, uh, our next question here. And um, this one here um, is dealing with the experience of seeing lightning and hearing thunder. So let's go ahead and watch a little short video. Um, kind of a neat effect here. I have three training oh, sessions in a day, so I need... Yeah, so this is one of the awful side effects of using YouTube is that occasionally we get advertised to. So hopefully you're noticing something as we're watching lightning and hearing thunder. Did you notice that there's a delay? Why is there a delay? And also, why is the delay different in different cases? Do you have any idea why? You might think that it has something to do with how far away the actual strike was. It happened somewhere. It, it hit something, right? Anyway, you can click on the link and watch all these, these lightning effects. I think that gives us enough of an idea. Um, so the deal is, is that um, the light travels much faster than uh, the sound. And so you can think right now that the actual the speed of light is basically instant. It turns out it's not instant, but it's about a million times faster to get to our eyes compared with the, the time that it takes uh, the sound uh, to get to our ears. This might be why when you go to a baseball game, you uh, see the batter uh, hit the ball, and then you hear the sound of the ball being hit. And that's because light is traveling much, much faster than sound. We'll cover this again. But for right now, let's think about this and uh, see if we can uh, make some sense of how to solve this kind of problem. I'll go ahead and pause here, give you a chance to try and solve this problem on your own. Um, see if you can uh, utilize that same uh, kind of thinking uh, from that very first problem, um, looking at this uh, um, distance and speed and time. How are those things related to each other? What are you trying to figure out? Okay, welcome back. And um, let's take a look at this. What are the knowns? Well, we know that we saw a lightning flash and then we heard it six seconds later. Um, the, uh, you might be uh, trying to calculate such something like this as you're curled up under a blanket and drinking some warm tea. Unfortunately, in the Bay Area, we don't really have very much lightning, so you don't really get much of a chance to, to see this. But if you go out to the Midwest, well, there's, there's lightning quite often, and you get a chance to have a nice uh, uh, entertainment. So uh, let's take a look here, and um, let's try to figure out how we can solve a problem like this. Well. I'm going to this time draw a picture. Um, here is the lightning strike. Okay, there's my lightning strike. 
That's some earth. Here's me, hopefully in a house under a blanket. But um, there's a lightning strike, and then there's some sound that comes out. We're gonna try to draw some sound coming toward me like this. But it takes time for the sound to get there. The visual, I see it, comes, the light is coming from the, the lightning strike directly to my eye. And let's just say it's really, really fast, okay? So much faster compared with the, uh, the speed of the sound. So if the light comes basically instantly, and the sound takes some time, how long does it take that sound to travel six seconds? So in other words, we have a time is six seconds, and we're actually noticing here that the speed of sound is going to be 344 meters per second, and uh, we're also given that a kilometer is about a thousand, is, is a thousand meters, not just about, it is a thousand meters. And um, so we can actually see that um, in about three seconds, it looks like we've gone a kilometer. So it looks like in six seconds, we've gone two kilometers. So I just solved that, boom, just like that, by just kind of looking at this number and thinking, oh, well, I don't know, well, how long would it take to actually travel one kilometer? And we sort of can solve it. Let's look at it a different way. Remember from before, we had this uh, kind of idea that um, we were trying to figure out a time before, and we figured out that it was a distance divided by a velocity. Well, we can sort of rearrange this if we'd like, and I can multiply both sides by V, V's cancel out, and we get distance is equal to speed times time. That's kind of interesting. So we can rearrange these kinds of things. So in other words, one way to think about it is velocity could be distance over time, time could be distance divided by velocity, or distance could be velocity times time. All three of these are equally valid representations of this idea. Um, these might be some things that you write down. Um, you might say keep a notebook and write down some of the most common equations that we see again and again. Things that will be helpful for you um, as you approach uh, different problems in this course. So um, we can use this here and we can say distance is equal to 344 meters per second times 6 seconds. And so if you notice here, the seconds here is on the bottom, the seconds here is on the top. We cancel out the seconds and we're left with meters. So we really just take the numbers, we, we bring them over to the left hand side, and um, we'll bring all the units over to the right hand side. Now we've got to do 344 times 6. Rut row. I don't know how to do that in my head, honestly, right? It's, it's too hard. And uh, we, can, we can like do some long divi we can do some long math things. But also you might just notice that like 333, three, three, if you multiply that by 3, you get basically a thousand, you get 999, right? So I could say, well, six, that's gonna take me to, well, that's like three, three, three times three, and then twice that, right? So you can see already that it's like t around 2,000 meters. Um, we can do it um, on a calculator here. I'm gonna bring up a, a calculator app that I like um, that's called Speed Crunch. Ultimately, you can use whatever you'd like. Um, if you have your own calculator, you can use your uh, iPhone uh, or some, something, a smartphone. Um, I think I have uh, Speed Crunch on here. Speed Crunch is kind of a nice, oh, I don't have it actually installed on this computer yet. So I'll, here's another way we can do it. It's pretty easy. I just bring up um, uh, a web browser here and you literally can just type in some numbers. Maybe a lot of you know this and it actually brings up a calculator tool and calculates it for you. So that's 2064 when I did 344 times six. And um, good. So, um, so uh, what did I say? <laughs> just said 2000, um, basically 2000, right? So 2000, uh, 2064, okay, good. So 2064, so let's go back, oops, let's go back um, to here. That's 2,064 meters. And we're also given that one kilometer is 1,000 meters. So in other words, I could convert this into kilometers by saying, well, I know that one kilometer is the same thing as 1,000 meters. This is the old multiply by one trick, and we're gonna go over this multiple times to make sure we really understand how to do this. But if one kilometer is equal to 1,000 meters, I can divide both sides, let's say by 1,000 meters, 1,000 meters. And you can see that these cancel out here and this is just one. So in other words, one kilometer, 
uh, one kilometer divided by 1,000 meters is just the number one. And I can always multiply by the number one and I'm not really changing anything about what this thing actually is. So you can see now that the meters cancel out and I'm really just dividing by 1,000 and that's 2.064 kilometers. So in other words, about two kilometers is the distance. So that's kind of cool. Every three seconds is a kilometer. Um, it's kind of a, a convenient thing. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss that also and we can put it into the context of miles later if we, if we wish. So it looks like the answer is two kilometers. Good. So um, uh, some really common uh, prefixes that we're going to see again and again um, in, uh, in this course are milli, centi, kilo, and mega. Um, you might see some others and we'll introduce those uh, as needed. Um, but milli is going to mean, uh, uh, let's say, one one thousandth of something. So a, a millimeter. Um, and uh, uh, We'll, we'll see uh, also a centimeter. Um, so a centimeter uh, is, um, we'll, we'll actually, uh, when, we're, when we're together in the class, I'll bring some, uh, some uh, rulers and you'll have a chance to uh, kind of see and, and get the experience of what these things are. Kilo is gonna mean multiply by uh, 10 to the third or multiply by a thousand. And mega is gonna be multiply by 10 to the six or one million. So uh, if, I give you a mega buck, that means you're a millionaire. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so um, maybe wrap things up here uh, for our discussion uh, for, for this um, engagement here. I'll give you some chance to uh, read over those two handouts, uh, the units for, uh, in scientific notation for musical acoustics and the math review sheet, um, and get you in, in good shape for uh, solving some of the uh, mathematical problems um, uh, for our homework. Um, so where we're heading uh, in this course is that we're interested in the generation of sound, not just music, but all sounds. And uh, you're going to find uh, that we generate sounds uh, through things that vibrate. And so if something vibrates, it's actually creating waves of pressure. We'll, we'll get there and we'll talk about what that really means. We'll talk about also about how waves actually propagate through space. And so um, you might have just a vague idea of how the sound is actually getting to you, but we're going to talk more deeply about well, what does that really have to do with the atoms and with air and maybe even the temperature of the air. Maybe that matters. And so we'll think about that. Um, we'll also talk about how we hear things and perceive sound, both loudness and pitch. Um, and uh, if we have time, we'll also be talking about uh, digital processing and how we record sound. So how am I recording the sound that you're listening to right now? Okay, so this is some practice for you. Um, I'd like for you to spend some time with the units and scientific notation uh, sheet. Make sure that this is really super clear for you how to solve these kinds of problems. How do you write? You see that I have um, kind of three ways of writing things. Uh, the first one is uh, the number 10,000. And then I say, well, how do you write that in uh, uh, like a something times 10 to the something, right? And then there's another notation, which is this E notation. You might find it a little bit weird, but um, I think that as you use it, you're going to find it to be more convenient. So in other words, um, yeah, I'm going to give you a moment to, to try to fill out this, this sheet. So go ahead and write down in your, in your paper. Uh, try to fill in what you think is the right way to represent each of these numbers. Go ahead and pause. OK, welcome back. Um, so let's take a look here at the answers. So this is 1 times 10 to the 4. Um, and you notice that that's 1 e4, this is actually the same thing. And so the e means times 10 to the, right? So it's some like a notation. Um, and uh, let me write a couple of things here. So I'll um, uh, bring up this uh, dot cam one more time. And um, so just to, to kind of recap here, um, uh, as I uh, look at these numbers here, um, if I did uh, 10,000 like this, um, that's 1 times 10 to the 4 because if I were to take a, a 1, I'll do 1.0, 1 and to 10 to the 4, I'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, and fill in the rest with zeros and the decimals now here. Um, similarly, with 54,000, let's say I took 5.4 times 10 to the 4, or E4, and I go 1, 2, 3, 4, I'm going to fill in the rest with zeros, and I've got 54,000. Also, I can do times 10 to the minus something. And so if I start with the number 1, and I say times 10 to the minus 5, I'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the decimal place is here. 
and I just fill in the rest with zeros. And so now I have four zeros and a one. So hopefully that kind of jogs your memory on how to do that. I like to write another zero after, uh, you know, before the decimal place, just so you don't miss it. It's easy to miss the decimal place. So I really want to encourage you to write an extra zero here um, just as a placeholder, like let yourself know that, that this is a point something, right? It's not just a oh one that it's actually you can see where the decimal place really is. So give you some practice with those kinds of things. Um, uh, please take some time to review that. Um, this will be really important to being uh, successful in the course. So um, just to recap, kind of how do we solve uh, word problems? How do we solve problems in general in this class? Uh, a, lo a good thing to do is to draw yourself a picture. Think about what you know and what you don't know. Maybe write down some of those numbers and their values. Um, maybe an equation that you think might be relevant. Try writing down your solution on the paper, not just the answer, but how you got there. So imagine that somebody looks at what you did uh, a week from now, and they say, hey, how did you solve that problem? And you say, five. I say, five what? You say, well, five is the answer. Well, but yeah, but how did you get there? And you look at it and you think, wow, I don't know. I don't know how I got there, right? Because you didn't have anything written down to help you understand your approach. So your solution is more than just the answer. It's, it's, it's actually the way that you're thinking about the problem. And so try to be as detailed as you can as you're taking notes. And so uh, I want to encourage you to keep a notebook as you're going through these video lectures. Um, this will ultimately be very helpful for you as you're, as you're working through your studies uh, for the exams uh, and also as you're uh, connecting the things that you're learning in the videos uh, to our activities in the class. Finally, once you get your solution, you're going to want to check to make sure that your units are right. And it'll, it'll tell you if you did the problem right. You also have a chance to look at those units and look at the actual answer and think, huh, does that really make sense? Does that, is that really what I was expecting? And that's a, that's a really uh, good scientific practice to develop, is to think if it sounds reasonable. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all I have uh, for our first uh, sort of uh, video lecture. And um, thank you very much, and um, I look forward to uh, further discussions.